No, 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 they stop. All right. Oh, I you think they talk a lot during the where we start. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, yes, I, she might more people. But they don't. I hit record, so I just want to. I was just saying, the folks at home are getting the full experience today, what, what usually happens. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, so we're back to our book, Stars Beneath Us. Finding God in the Evolving Cosmos. To those watching this recording later, hi. Um, you can say hi back. I won't hear you, but I will accept it <laughs> in advance. Um, so this, like I said last week, uh, there's a lot of things that are going to want to draw us into debates in this book. I'm going to ask you to hold on to it just a little while longer. Um, <laughs> because as I said last week, this these first two chapters are Paul Wallace's personal story, his journey of faith how he grew up in a Baptist church, how he also was very enamored and just very curious with science, timeline books and geological posters about timelines and things like that. And he's also a very sensitive person, you can tell. These, these big okay. epiphanies had big impact on him, and he felt these realizations very, very big. And so as we left off last week, the bigger his concept of the universe got, the bigger his concept of God got, who could have created, managed all of this, the more almost into the background God figured. If God is this big, who am I? And it just this disconnect. He called it the lead balloon because, you know, it just kept getting bigger and he just kind of kept getting under. So uh, this chapter continues that. Now we're going to get into some scholastic theology and Dante's Inferno and we're going to get into all this, all this stuff. After I think after this week you just read the rest of the book of Job and it's it's more of a story that's going through Job's story. Um, we're good. So we're we're gonna do our best to follow him today. You can tell the dude is academic and, and likes to teach. So we'll, we'll unpack this as we go today, but just realize that this is still part of his personal journey. And uh, that's, you know, we're going to take it as that. Uh, so the opening stories are about him. And even though he was a Baptist in the deep South in Atlanta, he was going to a Catholic school. It was a private school. His parents wanted him to get that different education, that different level of stuff, and if you go to Catholic school, then you're going to go to Mass on a regular basis. He said he went every month. Um, he liked Catholic worship, which is, you know, liturgically speaking, isn't that different from Lutheran worship or Episcopal worship, but he liked the structure and the repetitiveness because in his growing up, at going to Baptist church, it was all about you and your personal response to Jesus, right? And like needing to feel a certain way and do a certain thing. And he kind of liked that the liturgy took you out of it, that there was this form and function and this repetition almost that he liked that he likes systems right we hear that a few times in this chapter so um, um very much this dude likes science and systems and, and structure things like that um so you know he talks about how not only did he go to mass he took some uh classes that the priests or nuns taught including a christian history course um, a class called Biblical Archaeology, and he liked that kind of stuff. And he says, then, this is on, we're on page 16, he said, then there was the king daddy of them all, 
Father Kavanaugh's philosophy class. So that's where we get into some of this stuff. So before we get into King, the King Daddy of them all, Father Kavanaugh's philosophy class, I just want to ask, like, did any of you take religion classes in school at any point? I'm not talking like confirmation or, or whatever, CCD, which, something like that, where you went to church to do it. Did you ever get religion classes in school like that? I had a philosophy, a philosophy class okay. in college taught okay. by a Methodist minister, which I never quite understood what happened. Okay. I had a religion class at college. Two different disciplines. Yeah. Yeah. Religion class at college, even at State University. I think we had a choice between philosophy and religion, and I took the religion. Okay. I took a class in, at BC called um, The Bible is Literature, and I took it over like the winter break, which was like a month long. Um, and it was, so it was. There was nothing else competing for my attention. Was really good. Did anybody take class prior to college years? I agree with Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so did you go to a Catholic school? No. Did you get classes like this? Very good. Do you remember any other? Did this, did, yeah. did this bring back some memories? Okay. All right. Uh, anybody else? Gordon, are you going to be the resident expert? Uh, yeah, I'm not surprised you said when I went to church once a month. Seemed like we went just about every other day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> maybe, maybe the Catholics. Maybe the Catholics didn't have to come. Yeah. My dad went to Catholic school from kindergarten all the way through college. Oh, wow. He used to say he didn't go to church. Well, it's just, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> my mother went to a one room schoolhouse. Yeah. And in the area where my, it was in that French area. And so most everybody in the school, in the grade school, was Catholic except my mother and her brother. Mm -hmm. So they had one or two choices when they did the rosary every morning, was it either go stand in the cloakroom or sit there and listen to it. Well, they froze their butt off in the cloakroom. Sure. So my my mom went home one day reciting the rosary, and my grandfather went through the room. <laughs> Did you know just a big deal that day? Just for fun, did you know that now you can get a Lutheran rosary? No, 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 no. Yeah, it's it's a different prayer, but that that physical action of having the beads of having that almost like a mantra, a there's value with that. Yeah. So maybe you don't want to be praying to the Virgin Mary, but you can. There are things out there with with a Lutheran prayer beads or a rosary. Do you know the prayer? Yeah, there's this too. I don't. I, okay. It must be a thing because the, the Arabs do the same thing. I mean, it's not, I mean, how many different religions around the world have some kind of tactile, some kind right, of yeah. like, ring a bell, light a candle, have some yeah. incense, yeah. like, beef, well, yeah. So there's, there's something to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just yeah. know my grandmother went through the roof when she didn't home stop. I believe it. Yeah. I mean, how many decades was it taught that, you know, Lutherans and Catholics, you know, that was like the worst kind of sin was to marry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's my parents. <laughs> Being a Nebraska and not being a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> we're always the burden to the Catholic bus to go to like the Boy Scouts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, the resident expert has. I'll also the one stroke told the fours when I switched to the wrong public school. Uh -huh. I was in a class with a girl who gone through the Catholic school with me. Yeah. And we're having uh, world history. Yeah. And we were studying Reformation. Okay. And she turned to me and said, Remember when we were the good guys? <laughs> yeah, I made it two older I don't think, I think there's plenty of money to go around there, but yeah. Two older sisters that both married Catholic. Okay. And my mother was very much against Catholics. Yeah. And one of them turned Catholic. Actually, my oldest sister is Catholic. Catholic. Yeah. And my second oldest sister, her husband turned Lutheran. Oh. Um, so okay. his so, his okay. parents were very upset with us. Okay. You know, because yeah. you know, do you she, think people worry about somebody? Do you think people <laughs> turn somebody? Do you think people worry about that anymore? Um, my brother-in-law 
Bernard Lutheran, and yeah. the family had a problem until, her, until his father died and his mother went back to Lutheran again. That's so, awesome. yeah, yeah. yeah. And sometimes you have those gifts and then grandkids enter the picture, like, oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cousin, and sometimes my cousins went to a, a Methodist hospital for nurses training, but they sent them to St. Louis to a Catholic psychiatric hospital for training. And they had to quit because so many of the Methodist girls. Ended up marrying Catholic boys from this Catholic school. <laughs> they were losing too many Baptists. Well, as as fun as this is, and I don't play in because this is Baptist versus Catholic and yeah. and things like that. Well, we didn't uh, have any Baptists. No, no, they don't cross me. They they did sell us for sure. I think it was one in yeah. Southern yeah. Iowa. There was only one church in my old. And that's that was probably Baptist. changed by now. Yeah, we didn't have any. I don't know. I don't know. Different, yeah, there are pockets of the Midwest that are very much like Northwestern Iowa is almost entirely Reformed Church, a lot of Dutch settlers. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandparents were Reformed. Yeah. Oh, so my area was was Catholic and Lutheran. Yeah. And then a few Presbyterians, which I was sprinkled in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Flavor. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, so that, I mean that like I said, not what I thought we'd be talking about, but that's okay because this is relevant, right? Because depending on your background, you're gonna have a different uh, relationship not just with science but with theology, right? Depending on how your church did it. If you went to a Catholic school, you were getting a steady diet of Catholic theology and philosophy and maybe some other things too. Or history. Yeah. If they weren't Catholic, they didn't hear about them. Right. I <laughs> think <laughs> it was Catholic. You didn't learn about Fox or Wesley or any of those. Right. So, you know, that, that does play into it. So, like I said, this is part of his personal story is he grew up Baptist, but he went to a Catholic school. So, unlike most folks in that era, until recently, you stayed in your lane, right? And so this this crossover stuff brings out funny stories and like, you know, you know, conflicts in some families. But nowadays, oh, it, it, you don't hear much about that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, well, story about when I was a small kid, yeah. my mom was Lutheran, my Uncle was Catholic. Yeah. So all the boys were Catholic, all the girls were Lutheran. They went to start running away. How the diocese allowed that to happen. I remember that as a kid. Wait, the girls were Catholic? Huh? The girls were Catholic? No, the girls were Lutheran. Oh, well, then, yeah, if it was the other way around, I could have seen it. But no, I mean, if he was Catholic, so I thought he was Catholic. And now he was Lutheran. So all the women. It's a really weird spin off of the Brady Bunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so apart from Gordon, I'm mean, part of the church. Not a lot of folks were getting religious history, religious philosophy until you were at least in your 20s, mm -hmm. late teens, you know, 18, 19 college. Okay. So just, just to establish that, maybe this is why I heard a couple of people like, man, he's using a lot of big words, or this is like this. I know Darren was like bracing himself for this chapter. Like there's <laughs> there's a lot going on in here that maybe just part of our issues are we didn't have this stuff when we were kids. It's a little bit of a Learning curve. I'll praise myself for your sake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, all right, I'm going to go to page 16. I'm just going to read the first couple paragraphs of this section here. Meet the new God, same as the old man. Okay. I was there. I, uh, it was there I met a new God, or rather, the old one in pure conceptual form, the God of classical theism. It's a whole school of thought. This was not the touchy-feely Baptist God that I knew from church and home. This was the philosopher's God, the ultimate abstraction, a being omniscient, omnipotent, simple, and transcendent. Father Kavanaugh took us through Thomas Aquinas' five proofs of this God's existence, and we spent several class periods arguing about just why exactly this all-knowing, all-loving, self-satisfied, and all-powerful deity would bother to make the world and then let it languish as it so obviously does. In misery and strife. It was fun. <laughs> misery and strife. It was fun. This was new to me, a God that could be thought about and argued over and not just felt in your heart. A God I could pick up and turn over in my head and inspect from different angles. Again, I felt the relief offered by the system of Catholicism. Its higher philosophical abstractions buffered me. They were companionable. With them, I no longer had to meet God all along. And that's there's like I said, it's just some liturgy, there's some comfort in that. It takes mm -hmm. pressure off of you. Mm -hmm. I will say that there's plenty of Catholics who have a both and that have the philosophical, you know, system side, but also the mystics in the Catholic tradition and mm -hmm. the saints and yeah. a very service-oriented, very hard reaction. Um, and I think if you grew up Lutheran like me, like some of us, 
or Presbyterian or Methodist, but a little more, you know, land. <laughs> uh, we're not really good and as a whole at the heart stuff. And like the, you say with the Baptists, like the personal connection and feeling God, like we're, we tend to ride more up in the heads as most of you are in this table right now. <laughs> Came for this class, right? We so, have not be much about the Holy Spirit at all. No, no. Yeah, the Holy Spirit, it talks about the things it does, not the things it does in you, right? Like the Holy Ghost puts in you then. Mm -hmm. And what everything else aside, ghost is way easier to, to rhyme. And, and <laughs> 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 it's just songs in the handle that keep that holy ghost in there because keeps the rhyme going. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, theology of the heart versus theology of the head. Theology is a Greek word that means basically words about God or God talk, the study of God, right? So um, is your theology more heart-based, or is your theology, when you come to thinking and talking about God, more head-based? Um, does classical theism, scholastic theology, does that, and debating stuff like this, does that sound like fun to you? Like, what's the one? Yeah, you can't say fun, but it's yeah. We had some fun in seminary as we were, you know, picking some things mm -hmm. apart. Yeah. Okay. That's what I mean. That's what we're training to do, that too. Oh, Jacob yeah. and Israel, I mean, it, it, we wrestle with God. Right? Yeah. We're working right. those to wrestle with God. The I trick is not to just, oh, go ahead. Try to relate it to what we know of the world today. Exactly. Because there's a lot of people will just stick up here and wrestle. That's the whole Ivory Tower criticism, right? So you're just up in your heads. And that's why mm -hmm. there was this branch, multiple branches of theology that have come about in the last 50, 70 years liberation theology. From the perspective of the people, the needs of the people, that's where your starting point when you talk about God is the, the least of these. Uh, Latino theology, women's theology, African theology, these kind of emerging theologies that got out of that sort of centuries long system from the Catholics and the Orthodox and all the councils and debates. It's coming at it from a different way to connect it to real life, to actually wrestle with the ethical side of things too, how you live your faith out, not just where. You know, you have fun intellectual things around too. So um, there's that too. But he was really feeling the scholastic because that was new to him and it was comfort. Uh, then we get into uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, right? Yeah. Specifically the poem, The Inferno Part, which is all about hell and purgatory. Yeah. Um, so uh, <laughs> He gets, he gets into that whole thing and the, the system and almost the geography of it, right? And he said, you know, this is this is something important for this chapter. You have the, the medieval cosmos, so the, what the scientific thinking was and how that's described. And then you had the medieval theology. And they went together hand in glove. Because if you read Dante's Divine Comedy or the Inferno, there's a structure, right? The hell has these layers. Heaven has these layers. The earth is here, and like, like it lays it all out, and that fit exactly with how they understood the solar system, the world, and how it works. Like the heavens and the firmament are here, we're down here. So God is up here, we're down here. Uh, hell or whatever is you know underneath or below in the core of the earth. So their theology fit, fits their cosmology, their science. Okay, um, I would say they're. It was one of those ones where I would argue that the theology influenced the science. So oh, yeah. as they were studying oh, yeah. the natural world, they were trying to make it fit. Right. And they they start off with the hypothesis of this is 100 true. Let's make what we're witnessing in the world how does it fit within the scripture, not yeah. the other way around. But even if you look at like Plato and Aristotle, and then it wasn't that different. Yeah. Right. So there was this very they didn't have the tools we have. They didn't have the you know, electron microscopes and space radio telescopes, right? They, they were working with the yeah. And and then yeah, that's why Galileo got in trouble because he was trying to contradict yeah. yeah. There were what we said at the beginning. Exactly. That's that's threatening, right? Mm -hmm. And that gets back to the last chapter, right? Aren't aren't people isn't it all about us? It's anthropocentric, right? It's the people are in the center of the story, right? So that that comes into play. Um so chapter 18 or Page 18, um, 
that paragraph right at the top there. What suggests a cosmology suggests a religion, wrote Alfred Nord Whitehead. In other words, it's natural and good to seek some level of harmony between, between the creator and the creation, to look for a reflection of the divine nature in the non-human world. This is exactly what our medieval forebears did, and in the end, their cosmos became a natural home for the god of Asclepius. So, you know, I think of where I am at now. When I think of God, I'm thinking Trinity, I'm thinking three and one and one and three in this like eternal relationship. And when I think of creation, I'm thinking of all the interconnectedness, right? You know, you learn, I learned in, in school, ecosystems and food webs and how everything's connected. And if there's pollution in the water, the frogs die and that messes up the food chain and how our solar system and this, the, the gravity and the different forces affect each other if we're part of the galaxy. So like, for me, interconnected God fits interconnected cosmos, right? So the same thing can still happen today. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So if if God is inherently essentially relational as Trinity, then it makes sense for me to look around at the creation that God created and see interconnectedness and relationship there too. So I'm doing the same thing. I'm saying the science, I have my theology, and one's rubbing off on the other and vice versa. Mm -hmm. I want it to fit. Right. Um, that's where you run into trouble because sometimes they don't fit. Exactly. And then you either have to, you know, say la 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 with the things that don't, or you gotta do mental gymnastics, mm -hmm. or you have to uh, you know, force it. Yeah. <laughs> or accept that we don't know everything. Well, <laughs> 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 You can see how he said it. I've, I've been trying to telegraph to him just so you're ready for it, but also so you like get you through the slog of the first two chapters, right? So, but you can see how he's laying the groundwork for this to be a conversation about the book of Job. Mm -hmm. It's overwhelming cosmos. God seems so distant. What is you know? I I want to be the center of the story, but I'm not. You know, so that's it's setting this up. Um, well, do you does your do you have a system that? Um, let's see, where does I, where does system fit into your faith? And that could be about liturgy, theology, that could be about science, the creative world. Like, are you a fan of system like he is? Are you looking for these ways to make it all work together? I have always thought, and I may have gotten this from um, C.S. Lewis, that the evidence of evolution and the intricacies of nature created by God and we as man try to understand those things and we do influence them whether much or not but I see that just as evidence that God exists that who could have thought these things up right <laughs> you know what I mean? like it, it just and it amazes me to this day how much human beings have uncovered about the the math science the you know going to the this, which, you know like that's phenomenal yeah. that we built something here that went there <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know what i mean that's it. but i think that that's all god's doing you know what i mean well we are doing a lot of of, of you know, evolution system they think everything's made out of chaos it was all designed for chaos and if you stop and think about it um now the big bang theory has been blown out of the water they say it was because of the new telescope yeah um what i always come back to when i get worried or don't quite understand what's going on or like you say just accept it one of the things that i always fall back on is that laws of physics and the laws of nature are concrete if it was if it was chaotic and these laws are made out of chaos they would then morph oh, which, sure. which they do not they stay constant Meaning something had somewhere of some intelligence had to come up with the original laws in the first place in order for them to be real and not mm -hmm. chaotic. Yeah, I, so I that's what I always fall back to. And I said the other week, like, even if I don't understand the mechanisms or the constants, there does seem to be a lot of common threads yeah. through different layers of creation. So, like, one of the examples I, I did was branching, right? So and a, and a plant system, and a circulatory or nervous system, lightning, uh, frost patterns, you know, there's there's all these like seeming seeming parallel. I mean, we we as human beings look for patterns, right? That's just kind of baked into our DNA is to look for patterns, to look for meaning. 
So maybe I'm just looking for me, even if it's not there. But that's well, you try, you know, try to find those anchors. No, true chaos theory, it doesn't work because if you look at how the structure of matter is, it matches of the tiniest matter matches the structure of the cosmos. So right, that's exactly. exactly it, right? Right. So there's a repeating. So if you're a creator and you have a system that works, you're going to repeat that system right. on a large scale to a small scale. Yeah. Circular pattern, you know, your circulatory pattern, you get the branching. Mm -hmm. Is there's there's divine authorship in repetitive systems. Yeah. Yeah. And at the very least, we can say because if you're not, if you're agnostic, if you're atheist, at the very least, maybe you're not automatically saying, well, that's got to be divine authorship, right? But at the very least, you'd be like, but I don't know why. Mm -hmm. right? There's there's always going to be that, that question, and I don't say that as a gotcha, right? A lot of Christians will say that as a gotcha to atheists or evolutionists, like "ha, you don't know," like "ha," and that that's not helpful. <laughs> like you just be like, "Hey, I don't know either." Like find that common ground and start the conversation from there. That was turned it into a, a you know, I sprung my trap, you know, that that shuts down. Yeah, the I would do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> then if you have winners and losers, you'll have That's you right. Know, that. And you remember you put the book before, and I'm not faith to be an atheist. And the premise of the book is to take more faith to be an atheist than it does to accept the divine yeah. creation. Yeah, it's easier. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a lot more faith to say, no, there's no divine creator, and it plays out a good, and it's a very good. Thesis and science, but, yeah. but like I said, when I get where I'm feeling very confused, I always remember that the laws of physics are the constant, they're not chaotic, they've been around since forever and they haven't changed. So, something had not make those laws. All right, that's all I was about. Let, let's keep going. Page 18, this is O'Brien's side, that first chapter, or I keep saying that, the first paragraph of that section. Um, Terence Malick's The Tree of Life is an extraordinary film. It tells the story of a boy, Jack O'Brien, growing up in the of Texas in the 50s. Near the beginning of the movie, there is a 15-minute sequence showing small scenes from Jack's early childhood. They are unrelated but crystal clear the way early memories come back to us. One of these passes by so quickly and quietly you could miss it. The boy, a toddler in the scene, is whirled about by his mother under a luminous early evening sky. In the midst of the joyride, she stops, props him in one arm, and points toward the sky with the other. Uh, she smiles and says, almost under her breath, that's where God lives. So if you have this system where your theology matches your cosmos, um, your, then God is up here, we are down here. Higher is better, lower is bad, right? There's this quality that gets assigned to it. So he goes through quite a bit over the next few pages on this, you know, lower, um, high, low, God's up there, we're down here, God is good, we are bad, you know. And even though, this this is the big point he makes, even though science has updated a lot since the 1400s, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. Religion has it. And a lot of that language is even still just in our vernacular of, you know, high is good, rising up, low is bad, falling down, right? Um, on the next page, page 19, there's this uh, quote from... This is the God of classical theism, well described by this passage from the dogmatic constitution on the Catholic faith approved at the First Vatican Council in 1870. The Holy Catholic Apostolic Roman Church believes and confesses that there is one true and living God, creator and Lord of heaven and earth, almighty, eternal, immense, incomprehensible, infinite in intelligence and in will and in all perfection, who, as being one soul, absolutely simple and immutable spiritual substance, is to be declared as really and essentially distinct from the world of supreme beatitude in and from himself and inevitably exalted above all things which exist or are conceivable except himself. That is one sentence. <laughs> um, but there's... Right? But it's that last line there. Ineffably exalted above all things. Right? There's that geography. That doesn't speak to connectedness at all. No, it doesn't. It, it says God is completely different and alien, and Luther acknowledges that. There's like this alien grace he even talks about, like alien righteousness. We can't do it on our own. It has to come from outside, right? But then Luther and other theologians very much get into um, our daily lives and how it's lived out, and Jesus being uh, fully human and fully divine and entering our lives. Luther talked about the sweet exchange where we get all the good stuff, the, the righteousness, the grace from God, and Jesus on the cross takes all of our bad stuff. So it's not just that. And not to say that this is all of the theology. Either. 
but that's kind of a central part for a lot of church thinking for most of the church's history. God appeared. We're down here. God is completely different and above and beyond us. We're here. Yeah, there was there was in the New Testament the uh, one of the verbs that they talk about when Jesus is coming, people will rise up to meet him or something. I, we get that today. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the readings today. Yeah. So I can say where they think it's up. Yeah. Yeah. And if that was the that was the medieval and the ancient conception of how the world was put together. There wasn't thought of galaxies and the back in the east. It was this is the cosmos right here. Heaven, earth, mm -hmm. under the earth, three layers, right? That that was the operating procedure for a long time. Um, related to this in the next paragraph um, is a very central, another central theological teaching is that creation is from nothing. The Latin phrase there is ex nihilo, that God created out of nothing. And so in oh, violation of the Greek axiom that nothing comes from nothing. What do you mean? Uh, there's yeah. nothing that's in this chaos, which is what the Bible starts out with. So the Bible starts off with the void mm -hmm. and then there's <laughs> waters and wind, right? Yeah. So the waters and wind are the chaos, but the void is also the nothing. It's just nothing. Mm -hmm. So those are the two kind of primordial ingredients in the creation suit was nothingness and chaos. Um, and when you look at you know, Genesis chapter one, uh, over the surface of the water, there was water out of the surface of the waters of the deep. So there's this chaos and the whole first chapter of Genesis is God bringing the waters of chaos, right? Separated mm -hmm. the, the, the light, separated the waters, put the land, land and water. Here's the animals, here's the star, you know, like everything is like, but then you get Genesis 2, where God getting down in the dirt and like, you know, crafting Adam out of mud and breathing into them and naming the animals. So you get you get both. You get the cosmic, the cosmic, but also the relation. That's why they're both there. That's why they, the ancients didn't try to like make those two mesh together. Like, oh, you know what? Let's just uh let's do a supercut of Genesis 1 and 2 and, and make it work. Um let's see, page. 21, starting at the top. Okay, so thinking of um, empty space. This idea is an invention of the 17th century. The architects of classical theism knew nothing of it. Uh, for them, different places in the cosmos actually had different qualities. The idea of a vacuum is nonsensical. There were places that carry the intrinsic quality of being low and places that carry the intrinsic quality of being high. Gross and unrefined things tended toward the low places. Rarefied and pure things tended toward the high places. Uh, Earth, the heaviest and coarsest of the elements, which is why, you know, all that stuff about purity and dirtiness and all that. Um, not the planet, but the substance Earth. Resided at the lowest place in the cosmos, not because of gravity, but because that's where coarse and low things belong. Um, down is where Earth belongs. Its nature is to pile up in the low places. That's what it does. All directions away from Earth are up. Not relatively, but absolutely. It wasn't a sphere, right? It wasn't a planet circling the sun. It was the Earth is at the bottom, and you go up. And up, way up, is where God is. In fact, God is as up as you can get, as far down from here as possible. Uh, as far from down here as possible. To get God from down here, you must travel a great distance and cross a couple of major boundaries. The first one lies at the height of the moon. There you pass one of our lowly realm where the elements mix in perpetual stew. Kittens are born with dichrospis. Tsunamis roar, accidents happen. Everything green and beautiful dies and into the constant and immortal heavens. The heavens are nonetheless physical, comprised of quintessence. This is a pure and transparent and unchanging fifth element found nowhere below the earth. So that, that was the science of the time. And then if you flip page to page 23, he did his best to come up with a diagram of this, right? Mm -hmm. So God at the top, the Empyrean heaven of heavens, and then you move down uh, through the different planets, sun, moon, down to earth. Um, he calls that the obsolete cosmos because we figured out more stuff. Okay. 
Um, but in the end, who's in the center? Earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, humans are the center of the story. And so he goes on to you know, a lot of talking about, again, how humans are going to be the central piece of the story. Right? Um, page. Oh, one more rings there are that more insignificant of the field. Right, that's a huge. That's a huge. And think of how many rings we've added since medieval times. Other planetary systems, galaxies, universe, black holes. What what are we in the midst of all of that? Um, page twenty-two, uh, the last paragraph there. Switching back to the language of top and bottom, we are distinct because we are at the bottom. Like a rope fastened to a flagpole, the cosmos is fixed at two points: one low, human. And one high divine. In this picture, humans are simultaneously low and indispensable because we're connected to God. The whole story is about us. The medieval cosmos and the theology that grew up with it do not work without us. Both are about us. It's all anthropocentric. So God, we know we talk about God in relation to us, sin and salvation and things like that. Um, so yeah, it comes to us. Um and then, just going to skip ahead to page 25. Uh, that, that last kind of paragraph there that goes on to 25. The old cosmos was bipolar, not in a mental health kind of way, but the, the two parts of the flagpole. Um, and finite and static, nothing changed. If it hadn't been all of these, it might have been harder for the architects of classical theism to maintain their focus on God and humanity. As it was, the cosmos did not distract. It remained a backdrop to the real show, the human divine drama. That's why it's called the, the divine comedy, right? Mm -hmm. That's like, um, it's just us. And them. Okay. Uh, thoughts, questions so far on all the theological stuff and the impact it still has on us today, which we kind of bleed through. Have I lost anybody along the way? Yes. Okay. <laughs> What's your question? I don't even know enough about the question. Okay. Yeah. So, where, where the bottom is? I was a third grade teacher. I was not a third grade teacher. Well, we didn't learn all the more. All right. So, <laughs> what it boils down to is the way the medieval folks thought about it was Earth is at the bottom, humans are bad, God is at the top, essentially good. Um, and that was fixed. Nothing was going to change that. And the, the teaching about God fit with their idea of how the universe was and vice versa. The, the drawing is, is about Dante's. Is about Dante's. No, that's what that's the theory at the time. No, this is not. I thought that was Dante. Uh, no. the, he mentions Dante in the caption. He just says the way Dante described it, every direction away from Earth right. is up. What but I, this, this wasn't from Dante. Right. The way I was taught when I did through the philosophy class mm -hmm. was it, that was the theory of the time, and, and Dante did the, the trilogy that was really called satire. Oh, sure. Because the Medici you know, he was in power at the time, they're very corrupt. Yeah. And so and he wouldn't talk about the Medici, he's seen about getting the boys and you're killed. Right. So he wrote, good at that. He wrote the, the trilogy, and what he did was he took their sense of science and religion at the time. And put these politicians in different levels of hell. Yeah, sure. Different levels of hell without mentioning their name, but he said, surviving the point that everybody knew who they were. Sure. That's some of them are actually surprising. Some of them are surprising. Most of them are surprising. That'd be a project to do that today. Yeah. I'm sure there are those on the table. I always thought what was funny is that, that Satan is buried halfway in ice. That's what I was like. It's getting fun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, which is different than what our concept is. Yeah. Well, at, at this point, just, just go with this, that the system of that the church taught for centuries hasn't updated as fast as the science. So there's what he's at least feeling at this right. stage in his life uh -huh. is even more of a disconnect between the observable world and he's the scientist who yeah. got the scientific bent. So everything he's learning about the world and the cosmos doesn't match with what the church had been teaching, either the Baptist church, where it was all personal and completely uh, disconnected from anything scientific or systematic, or the Catholic one, where he said, okay, so it's all, the, you know, where it hadn't ever grown from the medieval 
thinking of science that it, it used as part of its its props. So he's just this is just furthering his disconnect. And you know, what does any of this matter? Uh, it's you know, as Chad, he talks about the year of the over the survey that was taken. Yeah, and what drives people away from the church mm -hmm. is that that is a it's one of the top six items, which is surprising to me too. Actually. I was too. Wait, no, I... it's in that later on, oh. sort of perhaps we got to yeah. come in a part yeah. of it. a couple more pages. <laughs> yeah, but just that, just that feeling, just that the church is irrelevant, and and, and we're having a debate in our schools all the time now. He talks about that, you know, the evolution versus creation, and we're you know, this is in talk all the time with what's current scientific teaching. So then we're getting this thing divide because we're teaching two different things. And yeah. It drives people away from church. And I, to, I mean, so you learn science at school. Okay. Then the churches should be taking the, the current scientific thought and having conversations and teaching about how this is completely in keeping with, like I was saying before, one avenue could be the Trinitarian God. You know, uh, it could be. You know, to some folks, another product of, of medieval theology is what's called the, the watchmaker God, where God wound it all up at creation and then walked away. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's why it's all that. Yeah. But what I've kind of come along with, and, and there are parts of scripture, especially in the Psalms and Isaiah, that, that God didn't walk away, that God is still actively involved in creation. Maybe not the whole everything happens for a reason, school of thought. Maybe it's not like that far side cartoon where it's God, God at the computer, and there's like a picture on the screen of a guy walking under a piano, uh, and you know God's finger hovering over the swipe button, right? Like, I don't, I don't think that God is micromanaging, I but I think God is always trying to turn things back towards the way it was intended to go, to the way the way it will be once everything is renewed. That God's always trying to turn. Sin back towards repentance, evil towards good, disasters, you know, Mr. Rogers said, but for the helpers, right? Like, there's always, I think, what God is doing now is always trying to nudge and push through the spirit things back towards track because the whole free will. Mm -hmm. but I, I, I think we'll start with micro. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm more of a macro thinker yeah. than I am a micro. So, yeah. And I have a hard time with micro. That, that, that's where you get folks like the televangelists after 9 11, after Katrina, after filling a blank. The Israel war right now saying, oh, well, you know, uh, the, the whole um, from the river to the sea, right? Well, the scriptures say that, you know, the Messiah will come when Israel is restored. Well, that's putting a lot of pressure on us. And I don't see God operating God. There's the whole religious. Oh, yeah, Christian science. Yeah. Um, there's, there's no way that the timetable of Jesus' return is dependent on us. <laughs> there's just no way. And so, to, but then people use that to justify all sorts of stuff. You know. What happens when you draw your universe with us in the center? Exactly. That's right. Exactly. So how much is the church missing out? And maybe the, under, under lots of layers, maybe people can't even articulate it, but maybe that's why a lot of people just don't bother anymore. Because yep. they can sense on some level that what the church is teaching and saying and doing doesn't, just doesn't match. It doesn't fit. It's archaic. It or the scientific or the reality of like, yeah. you know, yeah. if, if human beings are at the center of the universe, then why are all these bad things happening? But if you pan out to God being creator of all and managing everything and we are one piece of this glorious creation maybe we have a special role but it's not all about us well then man that's going to change the way people talk about god the way they live out their faith but if you think it's all about us what do you care about people who aren't like you or creation that isn't like you so on some level people have picked up for the last 40 50 years or longer it's like the 50s and 60s were like a the, the biggest population and, and attendance and everything with church. And then since mm -hmm. then, it's been a steady. Mm -hmm. People I've heard talk about, oh, the 80s, back in the 80s, the church was full and the school and everything right here. Um, and But that's that's faded. And it has, people are like, oh, can't we go back to that? I'm like, no, we can't. Not the way that we keep doing things. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. I read a book called it. Yeah, I hope we can. Future of Christianity. <laughs> and he talks in there about the need for the church. I mean, the young people probably are calling us to do something about the church, change the church, make it relevant. But, um, and he says that it's best, of course, for us 
not to get stubborn and say it has to be this way. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. It's good with the dot. <laughs> you have got to learn to work to say, okay, we're going to make some changes. Yeah. God's going to lead us. Change is another. But but if you think about it, um, when you say young people are trying to tell us this, young people could also include folks in their 50s because they've been trying to do that. I mean, the church attendance dropped off mm -hmm. when you know, you know, Williams is and, and yeah. myself, we're we're the exception, not the rule in terms of generational. Yeah. Yeah. Church attendance and participation. Mm -hmm. You know, we I, I've shared this before, but back in California, like our second year there, we had a council retreat, and somebody was basically saying, you know, we need to get the young people, the young families in church. What are we going to do? And uh, it was just this kind of broken loop, right? Broken yeah. record loop. And I'll never forget this pastorally said to the person, "Well, I mean, we've met your kids. They come to church once in a while. You raise them in church, right?" She had a, Grown son and daughter, and the, the son has very kids. You raise them in church, right? Yeah. They went to confirmation, youth group. They went on, on, on all the things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do they come to church? Do they have a church home that they attend regularly? Right so, like, clearly, what we've been doing is, mm -hmm. and, and it's not just science, but that's one piece. It's worth the sun. One of my sons goes to church every Sunday. The other yeah. never goes. Yeah. But you have better thoughts than most of I'm older. Right. <laughs> yeah. I can remember living in Charlottesville when the blue laws stopped oh, yeah. and the stores started opening on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can go now go for shopping on Sunday morning. Right. So that was kind of the beginning, and then more and more. And then um I feel like and stuff came along and my kids play in the afternoon. But now they play all day long. And but it, it's been a slow change, but it's been to meet the social needs. Of, of the working people and, and sure. families, and the church kind of got shoved in. Don't back. you feel though, like if church was so good, like if the the church life that mm -hmm. the church was advertising and modeling was so good, mm -hmm. people wouldn't have gone to the store till later. People uh -huh. wouldn't. Have, like I feel like they were just looking for the out. Oh, yeah, that they yeah. just didn't. Right, right. They didn't see the wrong. I just think it's more and more women yeah. went to went back to work. Sure. You know, you well, think I think yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, um, sometimes Sunday morning was the only time you had to do it. Sure. Uh, I guess As I, I can, it's it's my parents. I don't know whether they put guilt in me or not. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we always, no matter what, we went to church right Sunday morning. Yeah. And but the Catholics, are still, the Catholics are still losing birth nerds. Yeah. And they have Saturday night mass. So that's right. Yeah. So yeah. it's not the Sunday morning. No, it's, no, not it's, the, right. it's not the time of the day. It's you get online too. It's we can look into it. It's not that important. Sure. And but you know, one thing I would say is how many churches are doing something like this, having these conversations within their Sunday school or their liturgy. Having this conversation energizes me, right? Having this talk and having the open conversation, having this course. How many churches are out there doing that and bringing people in to have a little bit of discourse, to have a little bit of conversation yeah. mm -hmm. instead but, of just having that literally preached at the show? Sure. But even this is very much just for insight. Mm -hmm. right. and, and you know, even our guests coming from another church, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So this this is from this is an insider thing. Mm -hmm. And this is what I've been saying for years. How do, people talk about what I what we always ask, what brought you to this church, what keeps you family, connectedness, community, a place where you can be yourself, have these conversations. All right, that's cool if you're already inside. Right. How do you export this feeling? That was one of the hopes of Community Fest. And I think we got a little bit of it. We didn't get the numbers we wanted because of the rain and everything else. But I think the folks that were in here got a taste of that, okay. that connection and community. Like, um, like us women going back to work. I don't think that. No, no. She's not in good work. I might even try to get them to the church. So we need to do it. But did the church has ever adapt to say, hey, the world has changed? How can we support you now? No, it has not. Exactly. exactly. That's the yeah. issue. Yeah. I think early on, in, in the early 60s, middle 60s, yeah, when it started to change, that's when it really started to change. I mean, when I was yep. in college, yeah, that's when it started to change. The church had a bad habit of do it my way or go home. Yeah. And, you're right. and so you yeah. gave an altar right. to the college. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, either yeah. I didn't hear it right. I don't ever remember the church saying it's my way or the highway. Oh, it was never a Catholic. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It wasn't necessarily spoken in those direct steps, but it was communicated so, to, through so many ways yeah. of One way, you, I mean, just basically good. saying to fit in, to be here, you need to do these things. So like, yeah. For instance, we, we you know, Liz was uh, called first at our congregation that we worked at in Minnesota. Um, I came on about a year later after we had twins and, you know, all that stuff. But about a year and a half into her tenure, somebody came to her and said, well, how come you haven't been coming to your uh, Women of the ELCA circle? They, they had the, the Women of the ELCA Walka circles, they call them, like little, yeah, you know, right. there was a Ruth circle and an Esther circle, right? Okay. Yeah. Or, and she said, well, how come you haven't been coming to your circle? And Liz said, I'm not in a circle. No one's ever invited me. Like, oh yeah. Whenever a new people join our congregation, they're automatically assigned to one of the circles. Didn't anybody tell you? Like, <laughs> did anybody stop and say, does this circle fit your needs? Does what we're doing? How could you know, nobody ever said, like, okay, you're a busy woman working and doing stuff. You got kids, you got a job, whatever. How can we support your life of faith? No, it was this expectation of well, this is how we do it here. And you've been assigned, and now you have to participate and do all the things and bring a cake when there's a funeral, when there's a circle start. That's the kind of stuff that was always communicated without words. Of, this is how it has to be. And right. If you didn't fit that. I remember when I came here, our women's circle was a day circle. Yeah. But as more of us went back to work, yeah. I, I guess some of us were mouthy enough to say, you know, <laughs> we changed to a night, a night group, yeah. which I'm sure didn't do everybody else need either. But yeah. it, it helped those of us. Yeah. Erna was the first one who went back to work. I remember that. And and she thought well, she was going to miss the group so much going back to work. And then a couple of other us. And, and so then we switched to a night group. Sure. But we not tried everybody to put that in work. Not but, everybody's mouthy. Yes. <laughs> They're quietly They're asleep. Asleep. They just quietly fade. That's right. Exactly. Right. There's a story in the in the book. We're studying that group. You know, Bible no, study no, is called no, no. Christianity. Okay. And one of the stories is about a woman that I guess I think she was from California and I think she was in Fleer or something like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she invited uh or she brought she was working with gangs. And so she brought a bunch of them to church and they all sat in belt and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, what was this? This is messy Christianity. Oh, oh wanna be the next captain? Yeah. I don't, I don't remember. Oh, okay. I got it Anyway, so I have read that. Yeah, I hope I'm not that new. So, no, you're not. No, you're not. And, no, the next anyway, the church, the church said that they couldn't come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The church said they couldn't come. Yes, yeah. right. The disruptive, right? The, the distracted people. Something wrong. Well, it's right now. Right. They, just, they just fired another bishop. Another, the Pope yeah. Yes, oh, yeah, because yeah. he was criticized. Yeah. Well, yeah. this such. Third one, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even think of that, like the Pope is like, There's you don't, you don't get contradict the Pope. So nowadays, yeah. but, the Pope but, is doing things that don't fit the the laws, and so people are pushing back against that. Yeah, uh, against the direction. I'm pretty sure that was just because he's bringing the church forward. Yeah, yeah. I was being yeah. 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 Let's see now. This is an amazing conversation. I'm thankful for it, and I'm going to try to bring it home. <laughs> Five minutes to get to the rest of this chapter. I'm only halfway through my notes. All right. So the next section. I feel like that could be on a repeat. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is why I wanted to do this book. And it gets you going. Yeah. And so I, I kind of already covered the next part. It's all about the zoo and Willie D was a gorilla. Yep. And, oh, yeah. And you know, we can yeah. stick a gorilla in a cage with a TV and we think that's fine. But he's trying to raise the point of. That's only fine if you are the central character of the story. That's right. right. Like we we have this kind of audacity to say we are above the animals, just like God is above us, because that fits that medieval system too. God is up here, we're here, but we're here. We're here about the animals, and he gets into the distinction from Genesis one twenty six of being given dominion over the earth is not the same as dominance over the earth. I and for, right. for centuries, right. that. that was the church's attitude with regards to indigenous peoples, with regards to resources, with regards to how you do evangelism. You got your inquisition, <laughs> you got your forced baptisms, right? That's because we can see ourselves as above you, whether you're an animal or just a person who doesn't look or think like us, if you go with the European model, um, the doctrine of discovery, all of that stuff, those benighted people, but we have the light, right? What they had civilizations and kingdoms and science that we didn't have. So, you know, whether it's Mayas or Aztecs, Incas, 
uh, the African kingdoms, you know, the, the Moors and the Arabs, like, what, why do we think we're better than them? We might have a wonderful treasure we want to share, but if we're coming at it from the point of we're better than you, then we're already losing the game. Um, because then you end up having to force it. Well, <laughs> you know, Luther wanted, he was like really cool with the Jews for a while. I was like, no, no, don't discount the Jews. They're, they're, read the whole Old Testament. You know, this is God's word. These are God's people. God doesn't break promises. But then when he was like evangelizing them and saying, this is why you should be Christian, they're like, no, thanks. Then he started writing <laughs> the scribes that the Nazis used years later to bless the Jews. Kill them all, right? So, I mean, Boy, when people don't like what we have to say, then we try to force them. One of the things that came out in the early 70s, right, they, had, right. they, had, they had an albino gorilla in Spain. Okay. Uh, I can't remember his name. I think Snowflake, I think was the name. All right. But he was an albino, which means he had flesh-colored skin like us with blue eyes. Okay. And that was a big deal. In they Spain. weren't pink. Uh -huh. They weren't pink. No, they were blue. Okay. And, uh, this is what happens. Okay, yeah. so when I was in Spain, real quick, I was in Spain for a semester in college. I know. Um... Like one of the first weekends there, my host family took me with them out to the family plot outside the city. It was a big olive farm. First of all, I messed everything up because I didn't like olives and I was at the table. Like, <laughs> Seven kind of olives there. Um, not a good start, but the, the grandmother that was living with my host mom's siblings at the farm took turns living with different uh, people. So one weekend I was down in Gibraltar on a little day trip and I got back and grandma had moved in, which was uh, nobody told me. So um, I'm like just trying to make small talk. I'm like, oh yeah, I was just in Gibraltar. There were monkeys there, the only monkeys in Europe. And she's like, and I, I kid you not. She goes, yeah, there's monkeys all over Spain. Moorish people calling themselves Spanish. <laughs> and I was like, you know, cultural barrier, generational barrier. And I'm shocked that she just said that. And I was like, these are real monkeys, you know, like. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah. So that was a big thing when that when they had the blue eyed blonde. Oh, sure. White hair gorilla. Uh, it, a lot of, especially in Spain, it yeah. screwed up a lot of Catholics. <laughs> sure. <laughs> because there's this weird thing that we do where we have to be the center. Whatever our group or tribe or religion is, we have to be the, the heroes of the story. And the center of a lot of Catholics. And so that comes back to that anthropocentrism, right? That's that fancy word that just means humans at the middle. Uh, what is this? Page 26, chapter, paragraph one. The first full paragraph there. So here we sit in the old cosmos at the low end of a staggering hierarchy. As we muddle it out down here amid the general death and decomposition, the best material image we have of God's rule over the cosmos is our rule over the animals. Just as animals cannot imagine the complexities of human life, we bottom dwellers cannot imagine a God who rests eternally at the impossibly remote spiritual pole opposite us in both location and essence at the apex of all things. And then he gets into a metaphysical whiplash. Um, we've got... These, I uh, can't read one writing. We've got 28 to 29, and we've got the, uh, um, just these kind of metaphors of being down here versus up there. Um, very much that is the distinction. We're down here, God is up there. Um, the consequences of an antiquated deity. Um, that it just doesn't fit. Okay. Uh, where am I? Chapter or page 29. The problem goes far beyond my occasional bouts of metaphysical whiplash. As I mentioned, one of the reasons I left the church when I did is because the only story I knew, God made us good, but we screwed it up, and so God sent Jesus, who was really God, to die for us and make us again good enough for God. Made Christianity seem totally disconnected from everything I knew about them. All the real action seems to occur somewhere over my head. I couldn't connect with it. Had nothing to do with me and the cosmos I was learning about as a physics student. In fact, it left the cosmos out altogether, and so I ceased to care. I'm not alone. I regularly have conversations about church with friends and students who are not churchgoers, and they tell me similar tales. Many of them are scientists or science majors. They often acknowledge the benefits of community life offered by churches. They admire the ritual of meeting and the ritual of worship. They see how deep friendships can form over time in the context of church. Some have even admitted to me that they are envious of such friendships. They admit that life in Christian community can provide hope and direction and even joy. But more than once I've heard that, in the end, they don't join us because they just don't believe all that stuff. Because it's the archaic, right? And it doesn't seem to connect to the world around them. It's not just scientists. Um, when questioned, they admit to feeling as I once did about Christian theology. It has nothing to do with the particularity and messiness, nastiness of importance. 
of their daily lives. It feels made up and removed from the world they do. And then it gets into the survey that uh, uh, Darren was talking about. That Christianity is anti-science. Another survey about 2010 or so um, was all about what when you hear about Christian, when you think Christianity, what do you think of? And a lot of the top results were that Christianity is against certain things, against dancing, against premarital sex, against gays, against whatever. Uh, what is Christianity about? It's about what it's against. Uh, what is Christianity about? It's about you know giving money. Like it, it had nothing to do with the gospel. It had nothing to do with grace. It had nothing to do with the messiness of our lives and how God entered the messiness of our lives to redeem those messes. Right? None of that is really getting on the main frequencies. Didn't mention family. Didn't mention family. <laughs> I mean, that was I'm, I don't remember that whole story. Yeah. Maybe it was up there. But among the top ten were these things, these antis. That when people thought of the church, they thought about what the church was against. I would be curious to ask. I well, I would be curious to ask if you ask that amongst the ELCA congregations, mm -hmm. without prompting a pass right now, because we've got all on our mind, right? right. So, <laughs> no cheaters here in this room. Let me frame this. Yeah. What yeah. would what would our answers be as a church? Right. I would be really curious to see that result, not outside the church. How would we define it? I read that too, and I was like, man, it's I, it's just. I think I would I will say I've done this a few places, different parts of the country. I think most folks would say it's about the family, it's about the community, it's about the um about the Bible, it's about music and worship, that's always important. It's the things that we do together that they're gonna talk about. But yeah. And the support instead of being like the the church and is very negative. It can be right. Yeah. Instead of it being the noisiest parts of it. This is the way it is. You know, at least what we're doing here is uh, what do, how does this support the world that we're living in now? Yeah. You know, and that like I said, change is how it, it, we have to adapt. We've always had to adapt. Mm -hmm. People don't like that. <laughs> you know, and so really the don't. Still adaptation of sports on their lives to adapt. That's to right. Their exactly. Job anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I think the beauty of the Bible is that it is ancient and it is still relevant. Yeah, yeah it's about people. Yes, and you can hear the same story um, over and over again and get something different out of it as your own faith grows. Yeah, and it is. It's about people. Yeah. I so, think those TV evangelists, too, they they, they seem to they bring out the worst. Oh, no kidding. And a lot of people were watching those from home, and that's all they heard. Oh, yeah. And There's a lot of people in our congregation that listen yes, to this stuff on yes. like radio and, and, TV and TV. that's to me that's not the real church. That's not the real church. It's just like it's just listening to music. It's yeah. all right. I'm not saying music. I'm saying like the talk. Oh, I'm listening to Christian music. Yeah, thing. yeah. yeah. I, mean, I don't hear stuff. These evangelists are looking with us. I don't know. Yeah, to get you know, I mean, I'm sorry. That's like that completely turned me off to that whole genre. Yeah, you know, like I, I, I'm going to have. You know, next of all, um, right, real quick, we're, we're not going to get through all this, but just to say that messiness, I think that's important. That one word, messiness, because it's not just about science. It's not just about the disconnect between his perspective of what the cosmos is and theology is right. Because eventually, we wanted to have modern theology match modern cosmos but if you just take cosmos out and switch in messiness imagine how the good news would spread if we talked about how jesus entered the messiness and didn't condemn people but sat and ate with sinners and touched lepers all that stuff where is that yeah <laughs> so where's that where's that connection or is it just you need to fit the whole um page 30 paragraph uh, let's start skeptical halfway down the page. So he talked to a friend about the survey. Um, you know, this report seems pretty accurate. He concluded by saying that while the bullets don't exhaust the story, they point to something real. I think this something real has to do with an obsolete but still widespread theology that, before it does anything else, removes God from the cosmos and consequently puts us as little worms. Now, we need to come out of sin and everything that goes with it and our part and the consequences, the hurt we cause. But if all we ever are is this, you know, worm at the bottom of God's way up there, who's, who cares about it? That worked when you had the medieval system of serfs and they were uneducated and illiterate and you kept them down and poor and then hungry and starving and, and miserable. That worked. That it doesn't work now. Um, real quick. 
Um, let's see. The last section, what we kind of did already. Looking back, moving forward, what do we need to do in the absolute God? We have options. We could, as I did for a while, put God aside. Maybe it's, just, maybe it's not just the God of classical theism that is obsolete. Maybe the concept of God has become so tied to antiquated ideas that the two can't be separated. Or more radically, maybe the concept itself is tainted at the source. Maybe we should just let God go. And he says, no, that doesn't work for me. Okay, skipping down, uh, about halfway down 31. We could also try to build a new God out of the raw materials of science itself. Um, isn't the cosmos astounding? Isn't the wonder it stirs in us something akin to a religious feeling? Yes and yes. Um, but that's just not going to be enough either, he says. So last paragraph of 31. Just a few minutes ago, I walked out of my office onto the college quad. There in the western sky, I observed a conjunction of Venus and Jupiter. At that moment, these two brightest of planets were so close together in the sky that they nearly looked like a single brilliant star. It's a wonderful and beautiful sight, and of the very best and truest senses of those words. I stood there transfixed for longer than I care to admit, but in the end, the cosmos, taken alone as bare physical reality, leaves me cold. Its power and beauty is considerable, but it is not up to my personal belief for God. Okay, both ends. Good, good Lutheran, both ends there. Therefore, we seek more constraints. In our search for a new model of God, we try to remain, insofar as possible, within the Christian tradition. As we shall see, it is possible to do so. There are resources within Christianity, as we know it, that will help us find God in this infinite, alien, and evolving cosmos our forebears could never have imagined. The Bible, in fact, has something wondrous for those who feel lost because we cannot square our old ideas of God with that cosmos. There is a story there that removes human beings from the center of the cosmos, points us toward the cosmic margins for inspiration, and encourages us to trust our own doubts and questions about life, the universe, and everything. Which is a hitchhiker's stand reference. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to leave it there. Just thought that the book of Job, which is so hard and uncomfortable, could be the entry point to reimagining our relationship to the cosmos. That's what the rest of the book is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we we got to deal with this disconnect. I think it is important for the for cosmos and theology to have something in sync, mm -hmm. and I I would include in that messiness. Because even if there's constants, there's still a lot of chaos. So if we don't acknowledge the messiness and how God entered the messiness for us, then who's going to care what we have to say? Because um, we also need not just cosmos and theology to connect, but our conceptions of God and our reality to connect. That's it. I gotta go. All right. Thank you. 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 Thank you.